Welcome all to our 2024 New York Seafood Summit at the Culinary Institute of America. My name is Mike Saramella. I'm the Seafood Safety and Technology Specialist with New York Sea Grant. Before I get into more official introductions and kind of what we're here today to do, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. One, our uh, presentations today and event is being recorded and we do have virtual participants. So this is a hybrid event. Um, because of that, we do ask that as we go throughout the day, if there are questions, please um, raise your hand and wait for a mic to get to you. Because if the, you don't have a mic, our virtual participants will not be able to hear you. Um, we do try to ask that you keep background noise down so that we can make sure that our virtual participants have a good experience and can hear all of our speakers and panelists throughout the sessions today. And for our online participants, please keep yourselves muted when not speaking. Um, feel free to use the chat box at any time that is being monitored. Um, and there may be opportunity for you to unmute and ask questions throughout the day as we go through. All right. So back to the summit. And what we're here today to do, um, again, my name is Mike Saramella, Seafood Safety and Technology Specialist with New York Sea Grant, which is a multi-partner organization run through Cornell University and uh, the SUNY system. We do a lot of work in our coastal um, communities and with coastal economies through extension education and research programming um, across the state. As the seafood specialist, my focus is seafood, largely in the area of seafood safety, nutrition, sustainability, uh, marketing and processing. And in 2016, I was working with my colleague, Dr. Stephen Frattini, who's somewhere around here, and I'll introduce him in a minute, oh, in the corner, um, and trying to figure out how we can better engage the various sectors of the seafood industry across the state. And that's how we came up with the first Seafood Summit back in 2016, which was about 16, 18 people sitting around a boardroom table at, in Manhattan. Since then, it has kind of morphed into what where we're at today, which is three events across three regions of New York State. This is the second of those three events. Our first was two weeks ago in Riverhead on Long Island, heavy fisheries focus, engaging our local fishermen as well as our oyster farmers, so our marine industries on Long Island. Today, we're here up at the Culinary Institute with a little more focus on the culinary aspects, but we do have some farmers uh, here to talk to you today um, to introduce you some, some novel uh, species that you might be able to work with soon or in the future. And then next week, we'll be heading up to Geneva, New York for our third and final summit event um, located at Cornell Agritech. And that will focus on uh, applications for new technology in support of aquaculture. So largely more land-based recirculating aquaculture systems, which we do have here in New York State. And also looking more at the food processing end and a variety of resources available to industry to um, develop value-added products and bring our seafood to market in different and new ways. Um, so with that, I want to first start off with thanking our sponsors for this year's event, Cornell Atkinson Center for Sustainability. They sponsored all three of our summit events this year, so allowing us to provide the, the fun foods and seafood you're going to taste later today, um, get our great speakers up to the various locations. Um, so we thank them for their support. Um, our events have always been uh, supported through grant activities, sponsorships, and donations. So if anyone is available or able, we do have a, a link to our donation site. If you want to support future summit activities, we welcome that. Um, so we can continue to offer this and keep it free to participants. We have a team of individuals that have been working on planning these events over the years. So I want to take a minute to introduce this year's team. So in addition to myself, we have within New York Sea Grant, our aquaculture specialist, Barry Udelson, who's right here in the middle of the room. He'll be monitoring our chat box and providing some technical support for our online participants. Barry joined uh, last February, helped with our last year's summit, and this year has been integral in coordinating a lot of the logistics of getting seafood from a lot of our local producers across the state um, to the various locations. We've got Dr. Stephen Frattini with the Center for Aquatic Animal Research and Management. As I mentioned, he started or initiated this summit activities with me back in 2016 and has been on the planning team ever since. Uh, Bruce Mattel, your fellow with the CIA, former dean, now retiree, but still heavily involved, it seems. Um, he joined our planning team this year, so he's much more involved and engaged, but has been a host and a sponsor for these events for several years now. We thank you for the work you've done and the effort and support. 
Uh, and then lastly, we have our Cornell Cooperative Extension Fisheries team who joined uh, several years ago. We've got some reps up in the back, Kristen Gerbino, you'll hear from her on a panel later, and then Tara McClintock, um, and then our other fisheries colleague, uh, Scott curatillo Ageman, who could not come here. Amanda Doman, also up here, assisted with our Riverhead event. Um, so throughout the day, if you have questions, feel free to pull any one of us aside. We're happy to answer. There's a variety of resources throughout the back tables of the room and also up in the hallway from Sea Grant and CCE and Ag and Markets that are all free to take. So take what you want, use. Um, if you have questions about any of them, please pull us aside and we're happy to, to answer anything. So with that, I would like to uh, invite Corey Mosher up. Um, Corey is the executive director for the Legislative Commission on Rural Resources, um, and he graciously agreed to give us some opening remarks. So thank you, Corey. Thank you, Michael. Um, this is a very different experience for me. I mean, I make a mean uh, grit fritter. Um, so I, I'm tempted to like get into it because I'm so proud of it, but I won't uh, uh, mortify you with that today because I know you are all way better equipped than I am today. So as Michael mentioned, I'm the executive director of the Legislative Commission on Rural Resources. And I'll, uh, <laughs> in, in talking about an opening today, um, first off, I'd say I'm really excited that Jessica is here because she's going to talk about a lot of the opportunities in ag and markets and what's available to you. Um, so I, I would do the same thing. The, the, uh, the work that's being done in Albany um, to create access to markets and opportunities, um, there's a wealth of information and resources there. So I'm glad that she's here to talk about that and we can do that. Um, what my position in is, is held in the legislature though. So we are a bicameral bipartisan commission. Um, we, so we have both Re Republicans and Democrats and we have senators and assemblymen. So, we are the only entity in Albany that is looking at things holistically in terms of rural. And that's not to discredit all the things that the great work that Ag and Markets does or the Department of Education when they are dealing with their rural issues. And there's a lot that goes on. But we look within the legislature to help break down a lot of the silos that exist, right? We're here to talk about seafood today. Um, I'm sure there are a whole lot of elements as, as uh, extension is here to talk about the education and what that that exists there as as well as the opportunities through ag and markets and granting that exists. So one of the things we try to do is help break down those silos. Um, so we are holistically rural. OK, so. Corey, what, what are you doing here to talk about rural? Well, don't let the clothes fool you. I'm 20 years of fruit and vegetable farmer from Balkville, New York. If you don't know where Balkville, New York is, if you blink as you're going through, we don't even have a stoplight. Um, but, but we are the largest antique fair is held in Balkville every year. Just don't ask what's new. Okay, that's my, my joke for today. By the way, we're at a seafood summit. Do we have any uh, ice fishermen here? Any ice fishermen? Yes. Okay. Don't take offense. All right. Cause I am, I'm going to do a joke later and I just didn't want to offend too many people. <laughs> ice fishing, the dumbest thing you can do. Cause any fish that you catch down there, you shouldn't eat because they're freaking stupid. That's a, that's a Lewis black joke. That was one of my favorites. <laughs> it's a good excuse for drinking. I don't know. I think it's something about being a fruit and vegetable farmer and that's my off season. So to sit in a cold hut, it, yeah, I don't know. Um, so as a fruit and vegetable farmer, though, I'm here to talk about that link um, with, I see a lot of culinary students here, and I love the opportunity to talk from the farmer and producer standpoint to culinary students. Um, it's a very, very important, again, kind of siloed off link um, that I think we need to do a better job of. Farmers are told all the time, tell your story, tell your story. The world doesn't understand what you do. Um, I'm sure anybody involved in aquaculture or fishing that would give you a million things that the world misunderstands or doesn't understand what they do. But I'm here to tell you that it's not just simple as telling our story because everybody eats and everybody cares about their food 
and what they are consuming, what they're bringing into their body and where it comes from. So I want to add to that, tell your story from the producer side, but engage in that conversation and never, never, ever, ever hesitate to engage. You might not be able to leave for a couple hours if you engage a farmer or a fisherman or somebody that's passionate about producing food. You might not be able to get away from them, but don't at all be afraid to engage in what your values are and what you're trying to see and be an open mind too. Because again, I'll go back to the, the clothes part, right? For 20 years, I had my muck boots on and I was covering of mud and I was approachable probably to a lot of different people, but maybe not as approachable as I, you know, trub through Stewart's with mud and, <laughs> and things like that. So please face it with an open mind. Um, I, I'll give another little example of that. I um, was speaking in front of a large room of non-farmers and I had a, a sweet little old lady come up to me afterwards and like, you don't speak like a farmer. And a lot of people, when I say that say, weren't you offended? I was like, no, not offended at all. But it gave me the opportunity to maybe talk and open some minds. There are a whole lot of people that are involved in the production of food. So please, as the same that you don't want anybody to um, come in with bias about how you want to prepare food or procreate food or source your food, um, don't come in with bias when communicating with people that produce that food as well. Um, Cause they're all, I can tell you from our dairy farmers um, to our fishermen, um, to our fruit and vegetable farmers, there is a whole lot of knowledge and a lot of work that goes into to making and producing food. Um, and they come from very genuine places. Um, and I can, I probably can give you story after story of another quip that I use. You know, dairy farmers are all really well known for treating their cows better than their wives. And that's not because they treat their wives so well. It's because 24 seven, 365, they are working to keep their herds healthy and safe. And, and they really do commit all that time and effort that sometimes maybe they don't pay attention enough to their wives. And I've missed birthdays and Valentine's days, right? Because of the commitment that we have to producing food, it's all encompassing, right? Um, in this way, I will relate it to the culinary world. I did, I did work um, in a restaurant for a few years and I do understand the commitment and, and people don't understand the time that it takes, right? They just think, okay, from the hours of lunch to dinner, whatever the, the schedule that you have. No, the preparation that goes involved, the, the, the changing of your lifetime schedule that you have to work in the restaurant industry um, is, is, is uh, something I always admire because it's extremely hard and it's taxing. So anyway, I digress. So along those lines though, so why are you saying all this, Corey? Um, I, I want to bring home the facts that we're less than 2% of the population, I don't know what the number is now, less than 2% of the population is producing food. Okay, very, very drastic and something that we, we are experiencing a, a large change in our population. But over 50% of people are involved in food whether it is the producing, the supplying it, whether it's driving, uh, the distribution of it, the marketing of it, the end cooks that are preparing it. Um, that is a whole lot of people that care and are worried about our food system. And it provides a whole lot of great opportunity. I want to leave you today with a thought as we engage in all these talks, um, our farm was growing um, green beans that we would always send to Hunts Point Market. And we had the opportunity to work with Blue Apron. Um, and I was really excited about that opportunity. Anytime a farm gets to open up a new stream of supply chain, right, it creates opportunities and we can get excited about it. Um, one thing that worried me at first, but I think also creates some, some vacuums and some roles for opportunity is through just my quick 20 years, I saw the people that were around agriculture, okay, be less directly involved and in being coming from agriculture. So what do I mean by that? 
our suppliers, our truck drivers, um, the people we depend on for seed, um, you name it, are the people that market our products, um, the people that end up using our products. Less and less of that was coming from producers. And it's part of the reason that I got involved in Albany to make sure that, again, not just telling our story, but engaging in that conversation. If farmers are going to have less and less people that are in, understand what it what the process is like, the decisions they have to make to produce that product. By the time it gets to the food preparers and the chefs, there are so many degrees of separation that we end up losing a whole lot of beneficial knowledge from the produce producer standpoint. Um, so I want you to think of that today. And again, reinvigorate you to engage in where that food come from. Um, engage in further conversations than just going to the farmer's market, although that's extremely important. I have never, ever, ever, ever heard of a farmer or um, when I was at Loco Coho in Auburn from Farm Bureau down in Long Island to talk about um, aquaculture and seafood and all the, the great opportunity they have, but the challenge is never in my conversations have they missed the opportunity to bring somebody onto the farm to talk about what they do. So I really, really encourage all members here to do that and continue to that have those conversations. And please have conversations with me because this is what we're doing in Albany, right? We want to make sure that we're creating good policy, both internally and then also externally talking to people, make sure that we're making very good food policy. Our, our Senate chair for ag, um, Senator Henchy has made it a point to talk about how it's not just ag committee, it's food and ag. And that's an important distinction to make. So thank you for having me here today. I really look forward to the conversations. And yeah. All right. Thank you, Corey. And thank you so much for being here today. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome up Bruce Mattel to welcome us all to the wonderful CIA as our host today. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Um, I was Senior Associate Dean for uh, 12 years, retired uh, last May, but I still have some part-time gigs here. So if anybody's confused what I'm doing here, that's what I'm doing here. <laughs> um, but I wanted to say that 38 years ago, I worked at La Bernardin, a three-star Michelin restaurant in New York dedicated to it's basically seafood. And that was kind of the start of me being very passionate about seafood throughout my career. But one thing I could say is we were we were pretty much on top of things there in terms of uh, sourcing and utilizing local product. And, you know, some of the philosophies that we adopt today, we were using back then. And this was a restaurant owned by two people from France, from Brittany, France. They had a restaurant in Paris. So when I started working there and I started to see skate on menus and monkfish on menus, and we were getting sea robins to use in our soup de poisson and local bluefish in this four, four star, three Michelin star restaurant, I was pretty amazed because a lot of these products were like giveaways. They were bycatch largely, not a targeted catch. And they were also... I remember my first job in New York, the, your seafood purveyor would just give you skate for like family meal for free because there was no real market for it. But after Le Bernardin put these fish, including black sea bass, which is now pretty much a coveted fish, on the menu, it started to take off. And why? Because the public was getting educated, not formally, but they were getting educated through the hype and the marketing of Le Bernardin and the press that it was receiving. And then, you know, fast forward, I come to work here and, you know, I was fortunate uh, to teach the seafood class, to write curriculum for the seafood class and, uh, you know, to always be involved in different type of seafood based uh, organizations and efforts that the CIA has. I started realizing the, the importance of education more than anything else. Uh, two weeks ago, I went to the seafood summit that we had at Riverhead 
Long Island. Now, Long Island is where we have marine coasts in New York State. That's pretty much it. I mean, there's a little bit on what in Westchester, but there's really no commercial fishing there. But you know, we have basically Long Island, right? So the fishermen were a big part of this conversation. And the fishermen's frustrations were, were based on regulatory. So a lot of uh, things that Corey was saying, they were frustrated because of all the regulations that they have to jump through hoops to in order to you know meet quotas or, or to uh, get their product to market and all that. They were a little frustrated about that. And they were also frustrated a little bit about the lack of processing because people, the public want, if you're going to go, most public want when they go to a fish market, they want filet fish, right? They want something easy. So it's, it's really up to us to start to educate the public more. When we go out in industry and we write menu copy or we, we, have, we train our servers to talk to the people and to get them to try different things, sample different fish, even if you're not on a coastal region, see what's indigenous to the area, whether it's a freshwater fish or so. I mean, there could there are landlocked salmon in some parts of this country. There is trout in certain parts of this country, walleye pike, pickerel, different products that are still really, really good if handled correctly. And I know our students would be able to handle them correctly. But education is the key because if the public demands change and all of a sudden everybody's demanding skate, then everybody will respond. They'll build a processing plant because the demand is there. We'll be able to lobby better in, in uh, government in order to get some of these rules maybe eased up or at least proportionate to what the risks or the, advantage or the challenges are. So all of this is very, very important. And we're in the place here at the CIA where we have seafood education and we have applied food studies which uh, to Corey's point, we engage with farmers all the time in our applied food studies program. That's based on sustainability, relationships, uh, the supply chain, all of that is so, so important. So understand that seafood has also its terroir, right? Like wine does. You're gonna have two oysters today, both of them from the Great South Bay in Long Island, but they're gonna be different. Why? They're grown in different areas, right? So basically all these East Coast oysters are the same species, but based on where they're growing, they're gonna take on a little bit of a special characteristic or more, right? So these are the things you need to understand, get your customers to understand. That you could have a menu, a menu with all New York oysters and have six different types of oysters on your menu. It's not much different than you having a more oyster from Prince Edward Island, an oyster from Massachusetts, an oyster from Long Island. They're all the same species. But why not if you're in this area, why wouldn't we do more of that, right? So I know I could go on and on, right? I got a little passionate there. Am I cool? Okay. Uh, anyway, I just want to welcome you all again. Hopefully you gain some good insights here. And then after our networking session, I'll give you a little preview. We're gonna have those two oysters. We have a little champagne mignonette. We have a uh, smoked trout riette, and that smoked trout comes from Sky Top Springs up in Sydney Station or uh, upstate New York in the Catskills. I think it's called Sydney Station, the town. We have um, Hudson Valley steelhead trout, farm-raised, land-based. That's uh, up in Hudson, New York, which is about 45 minutes from here. And we have wild skate from Long Island that I, I breaded and fried with an olive mayonnaise. So it's gonna be good, right? It's gonna be good food and it's all gonna be New York State based. So hopefully you'll enjoy, okay? But when you eat it, don't just enjoy. Say, oh man, just New York? Oh, cool, you know, all right? <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. All right, so next up, I want to invite uh, Jessica Brooks with New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets for a little bit of an in or agency update. She's gonna share some opportunities, a little bit about the New York State Grown and Certified Program. So if you're not familiar, 
We've got Jessica here today to share some of that, um, answer some questions, and there's also some of their resources available up on the back table up in this corner. So, uh, is it easy? Or avoid doing that. That'll mess you up. Should be good so they can see it online. Yes. Oh, you might have to get out. You'll have to end it there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Apologies. One second. All right. All right. Oh, sorry about that, Gillette. Um, I'm Jessica Brooks with New York State Department of Ag and Markets and the New York State Grown and Certified Program. Um, this audience is a little different than the rowdy crew that I attempted to speak to in Long Island. I was the last speaker, so Michael very kindly did not put me in that same spot again. Um, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about the program itself, because I think that is probably the most important thing for this room, is to understand what that is. Oh, sorry. Um, so in 2016, um, we decided that it was time for a next generation of New York's agricultural branding program. So prior to New York State Grown and Certified, it was Pride of New York. And many of you probably still see that logo on many items. The difference between Pride of New York and New York State Grown and Certified, and there are a few, um, but probably the most significant is that to be in New York State Grown and Certified, you actually have to be growing or raising your food in New York. Um, whereas Pride of New York, a it really, you had to have a business based in New York. So the seal started going on orange juice and peanut butter and coffee, and it became very confusing to the consumer. So for New York State Grown and Certified, prior to the launch of the program, there was a lot of consumer research that was done, and it was determined through, you know, one-way mirror panels and all of that, that what's really important to New Yorkers is food safety, and that is local, that being first and foremost, people want their food to be local. Um, and hyper-local, if possible, and that there's a food safety component and an environmental component. So that educated the program. We incorporated all three of those things into New York State Road and Certified, um, and it is category specific as to what the food safety may be, um, and so it really depends whether you're growing produce or you're, you know, making milk. Whatever it may be, you have a food safety component. Um, so there was a okay. So since 2016, we have launched category by category, kind of as the demand was there, um, as we figured out what the standards were, being really careful to keep them consistent. So this is where we are today in terms of seafood participants in the program, and we're pretty happy about this, but obviously really want to see this grow as much as we possibly can. Um, why do we want to see it grow? What are the benefits to the growth of this program? It, it makes the products more accessible to consumers in that consumers can go to our website and find these products on a map search feature. You can put in your zip code and you can put what product you're looking for and you can search for that. So whether you're in a restaurant, you're looking as to where to buy in your neighborhood, wherever it might be, um, this really allows you to find New York State Grown and Certified products that you know have been raised and harvested and processed to a certain standard. Um, the other reason why it's great to join this program as a producer is because of the grant opportunities. Um, I'm going to go pretty quickly over some of this as it may not apply to this group, but one that we have that's coming up that is, is a terrific opportunity for producers is a mini marketing grant 
um, that's up to $10,000. We call it a mini marketing grant because they're not competitive. It's first come first serve. It's much easier for producers with their busy schedules to access this funding. Um, so that can go be used for product changes. We know we had many, many oyster growers that bought um, new bags, you know, with their logo and our logo. Um, they've used it for digital marketing. It can be used for geo-targeted um, digital advertising, you know, catch that person that's about to drive by your cooler on the side of the road. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities there um, and that should be out within the next month. The Infrastructure Technology Research and Development Grant is um, there's five budget allowing, there should be five rounds of this grant. Each one of them is 5.8 million. Um, each grant is up to $250,000 per project. So when we're talking about accessibility, when we're talking about processing, um, this is really a great opportunity. And a business, it can be a, a nonprofit who applies for this. It can be a group of producers who work together um, to maybe each apply for a different component of one bigger idea. Um, I am not the program administrator, so I can talk a little bit more freely about it since I won't be scoring these projects. Um, but it, it's, it's about community impact as well. So kind of the bigger ideas probably will score higher in terms of how far that reach is. Um, you know, one of the things, my firsthand experience with not being able to access um, processed seafood from New York was during the beginning of the pandemic when we launched the Nourish New York program. And this put money into the hands of food banks to buy local food. And all of these food banks on Long Island and emergency food providers wanted to be able to give, you know, put put seafood, put frozen fish into these boxes that were being handed out by the thousands and mall parking lots when we were in the worst of the worst. Um, and there was really one fish processor in Long Island who was able to meet that demand. So these grants are exactly what we want to see more of this infrastructure being built. Anything that can help with audit. When we talk about this grant, it's really about resiliency and kind of the lessons that we learned during the pandemic. What do we need to do to build a more resilient food system, which I'm sure is something you guys talk about all the time. Or if you don't, you should be. But um, so anyway, so that's a very exciting grant, and that will also be launched hopefully within the next month. Um, <clears throat> so we have the USDA Northeast Regional Food Business Center. Um, these are grants that I, you know, are just coming out with some more of the details, but I wanted to touch on that and be able to give links to have them be found. Um, again, back to resiliency, the USDA Resilient Food System Infrastructure Grant um, these, I believe, can be used for dock improvements. I mean, I think there's a lot of seafood-focused infrastructure that this can be used for. So our website, um, and this is what our search feature looks like, and I don't need to go into all of it now, but it was just redesigned. It's got a lot of new features. Um, you're able to, um, just this past week, you're now able to export an entire Excel sheet of everybody who's in the program, but you can also look category by category and you can search zip codes and the rest of it. And so that is really a great feature. We're hoping to add other elements to it, like who has an online sales capability. <laughs> um, you know, who, who does e-commerce? Who are you able to buy directly from? Who has stands at their farm or, you know, their dock or their house, whatever it might be. So it has a lot of ways to find the local road and certified products. On our website um, at Get Certified, are all of the applications and it is the seafood aquaculture is the application that producers would be looking for. Um, 
one of the things that is kind of funny about the program is when it first launched, um, all of the ads were run in restaurant trade magazines. That was the entire focus was bringing restaurants into this program. And we've not done a very good job of that. So I'm kind of throwing it out to you all to think about that and try to think about ways that grown and certified and a restaurant could really team up a little bit more effectively. Um, we have done a couple promotions. We ran um, a kind of a January oyster celebration in New York City at five different um, kind of go-to oyster houses. And the idea of it was to kind of keep New Yorkers celebrating after New Year's. You know, everyone thinks of the oyster as this celebratory food. Why not eat it all the way through January? You know, why stop with New Year's Eve? So doing more partnerships like this is something we'd really like to do. There is a strategic partner application on our website that is essentially focused on retailers and wholesalers. But as a restaurant, you know, it, it, I don't see why a restaurant couldn't use the same application. Let us know who you're buying from. It may be another conversation that takes place, but, you know, at least that's a start and we'll figure it out from there. That's usually how we get <laughs> at new things in the program um, as is. I do have my colleague here, Jessica Hennessy, who is from the Taste New York program. Um, and I know that she's beginning stages on working on a seafood trail on Long Island which will also be a really exciting development. So stay tuned for that. Um, yes. So, are we so is the certification just certifying that the product was grown in New York? Is there any other criteria that uh, like that we would share with customers, for example? Yes, um, it, it kind of, so, for produce, you know, just because it's an easy example, you have to be GAP certified. So there is that food safety certification for everything. For seafood, you know, it's generally all your DEC requirements. It's HACCP. It's when you go to the application, you will see it's kind of a choose your own adventure. You know, what kind of producer are you? Do I need this? Do I need that? Um, we do not ask producers to reapply, but we do ask that they keep everything up to date. Um, if they go to apply for a grant and their certifications um, and licenses are not up to date, it does not put them in the same position as everybody else. So you gotta keep on sending us your stuff. We will someday have an automated system that sends out this alert that tells them to do so. But um, but yeah, so I mean, basically, you know, this is this is a great program. I mean, with seafood and, and other categories as well to explore, figure out what farms you wanna go and visit, producers around school, you know, Long Island, wherever you may be in the state, you know, this is a, a terrific resource to finding local product. And that is my contact information. Um, my colleague, Laura Smalley, is the one who processes applications. And so I'm sharing that information as well. But thank you all very much and good luck. Any quick questions for Jessica? No questions. Oh, question up here. Remember, wait for those mics. Thank you so much. One question, if you are providing this, this grown and certified, let's say someone who sells at a fish market, at a farmer's market, but then they're also selling like Norwegian salmon, how are you able to like have a clear message of differentiation of the products because that could get confusing for consumers. Definitely. And they're only allowed to use the seal on those products that are specifically meeting that criteria and have been approved. 
when you join the program, you get a certificate that states which products you are certified for. We find this a lot with breweries who may have three beers that are very much locally sourced, but then they're gonna do some more experimental beers that maybe are not. Um, we only certify those that are, and in the licensing agreement, you know, it's fairly clearly requested that that marketing only be applied to those items that are. Um, so it's not an umbrella, it is product specific, um, yes. And it's free, which is the other thing I did not mention, so. Thank you, Jessica. And I believe Jessica's sticking around. So if anybody has questions throughout the day, you can always uh, stop by and ask uh, Jessica or Jessica about Taste New York or Grown and Certified. Uh, also great to keep in mind as these infrastructure grants come down the line, while you may not be eligible as those growers or producers are exploring development of infrastructure and value-added products, they might need chefs to help with research and development of value-added products. So could be new opportunities coming about related to R&D and development of new products for market for our local seafood. So think about that. Um, and next, I'd like to invite up Dr. Stephen Frattini. He's going to be our industry spotlight this week. After eight years of the summit, we're finally letting him speak about his business and the work that he's been doing because he is as an aquatic veterinarian starting to explore seafood processing as well. So I'll let him tell you about that. I'll also introduce him as the MC for the rest of the day. So I'm gonna take a break and Steve is gonna take over for me for the rest of today's session and I'll come back at the end. Let's see. Thank you, Michael. Hold it away. Um, so I'm very glad that everybody was able to be here today. This has been, you know, one of the parts of the meeting that we've been trying very hard to develop over the years is getting culinarians into the room. And it took us about seven or eight years to really finally make the jump. So we're really glad to be here at the Culinary Institute. And I really want to thank uh, Chef Mattel for working with me on a number of projects, in including this one. So for this presentation, it was, I told Mike, it was very hard to try and put together the last 10 years of what I've been up to. Oh, I don't know what to, okay, I can't wander. Um, gotta stay in front of the camera. It was very difficult to try and put together 10 years of, of work into about a 15 minute talk, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best. And one thing you're probably gonna notice, and I didn't really even notice it until just now, is that a lot of the stuff I'm gonna present, you've been hearing from a lot of the people that already spoke and, uh, I think that's great because this is what Mike and I always expected to have happen. So I'm Stephen Frattini. I am a veterinarian by training. The Center for Aquatic Animal Research and Management is my practice. We do fish and invertebrate work. I went to Cornell's College of Veterinary Medicine where I worked in the aquatic animal health program for five years. So I've been involved in this space since about 2005. Um, the specialization, I can kind of call that now because we do have a a specialty in fish practice is fish production and fish health. And over the last 10 years, I believe I've developed a little bit of expertise in seafood and um, what I'm gonna call integrated seafood science. And I also have a background in, in compliance, regulatory compliance. I'm a member of the Cornell Agritech Center for Excellence with a project that I will be talking briefly about at the very end. I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly, but this is the dream right here. These three pillars of the Center for Aquatic Animal Research and Management, or as I call it, Sea Farm, is my aquatic veterinary practice where we do disease work, we do consultations with farms, we do um, management and biosecurity consults. So really the dream is to work with the farmers on the ground, help them find efficiencies, help them deal with disease problems and help them have the highest quality product. Research and development is something that in 10 years, I haven't really touched on all that much, but it's always in the back of my mind. Over the last two or three years, we had been working really on the, this middle part, this low cost on farm behavioral monitoring. We had put in a grant with Cornell and with a private uh, AI company that does visual learning. Uh, we didn't get the grant, but we spent a lot of time talking about the project and how we might be able to leverage technology to support our farmers. So R&D is always something that we're very interested in. But what I've spent most of my time doing over the last 10 years is this outreach and education pillar. And I've been working very closely with Mike and producers and the culinarians that we can find and the farmers and the fishermen. And 
The term that I'm going to be using is integrated seafood science. And you're going to see these three items in this last pillar or what I'm going to talk about really over these last 10 years. This is our facility in Wingdale, New York. I have to show pictures of it because I built it in 2019 and then the pandemic hit. And the only thing I was really able to do was get equipment into it. But as you can see, we actually, ha we actually have a facility for doing uh, fish disease work. So I'm proud of it. So you have to see it. Now, integrated seafood science. What is integrated seafood science? It's, it's a phrase that I, I coined with Mike pretty early on. And really, it's the entirety of the seafood supply chain. And it goes all the way from, can I point with this? I don't even know. I don't think I can. You're just gonna have to follow me here. Um, you have the consumer all the way on the right, and then you have aquaculture and commercial fishing, but it's all the other components, right, that are involved. And they all have to work together and they all essentially need to be engineered to function together. Otherwise, this whole system breaks down. I borrowed this and, I'm, and I, I just, just look at it. You don't really have to look at the words too much, but first I want you to look at the end consumer, right? The whole idea here is to get this product to the consumer. And there's a couple of different ways to do it. If you look in the upper left-hand corner, we're gonna highlight those. There's things like subsistence farming, just going out and catching whatever you can in the ponds or the lakes near where you are. The wild capture fisheries, you'll see some overlap with the environment. Aquaculture, again, you see a little bit of overlap, but you're noticing that there, there are all these different areas that are required to be functioning in order for us to have a functioning seafood ecosystem. But that still doesn't even get us to the consumer unless you're in a subsistence fishery. Then you have all these other aspects on, on the back end, right? This is where you come in as culinarians, as restaurateurs, uh, institutional food service, distribution. And you can see if I go back and forth, there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of stuff between the, the fishing or the production and actually getting to the consumer. And this isn't something that I think a lot of us came out of school just knowing from the get-go. This is something that we had to earn and learn as we went. Although I do hear you have a very good program here, so you probably have fewer gaps in your map than I did when I started. So what I wanna do now is I kinda of wanna go through some of the aspects of that, that integrated seafood science platform. And I wanna talk about some items that are gonna be highlighted on, on these slides that have come up over the last 10 years that I still feel we aren't necessarily addressing as well as we could. So in the commercial fishing sector, something that's come up for a, for a very long time and, and it came up at our, at our summit when we were out in Long Island was supply chain issues. Essentially, how do you get from the boat to the dock or the dock to the market or the dock to the consumer? H how does that really function? And in, in Long Island, we heard that there is a, a, a fish processor, not far, but far enough away from the docks, and they didn't even know about each other. They made a connection sitting up on the, on, I don't want to move away from the camera, sitting up on the panel that, you know, like, like, like we're going to have today. They made a connection there. Right, so there, there are still significant issues and, and you might even hear from one of our panelists about how difficult it is to get from the end of Long Island just to the other end of Long Island. It's a long island. So, you know, it's in the name, it's, it can be tough. The logistics can be difficult. In aquaculture, in New York, it's still a relatively, I would consider a relatively nascent um, endeavor. We have a couple uh, medium to small, large farms, I guess you might say, but there's the farming is at various sizes in New York from small farms, like where the trout you're gonna to have today came from to larger facilities, like one of our panelists uh, is gonna be at up to the Hudson Valley Fish Farm, which is probably the largest of the facilities we have. So that, that creates complexity for what the marketplace looks like for them. The species are different and they're, you know, people are always looking at different species. You know, we can grow lots of them, but which one should we grow? Which ones ought we to grow based on the consumer or, um, different market factors, right? On-farm health management is where I come in and I'm trying to do that kind of work, but that's very difficult um, sometimes because the pricing, the things that have to go into doing that work, it's not necessarily core to fish farming the way it is for things like dairy production or poultry or swine. Public consumer climate regarding fish farming, as you can imagine, it's up, it's down, it's left, it's right. It's very hard to pinpoint what the consumer thinks about farm fish. Supply chain issues, they're very similar. You know, in New York, we've identified part problems with local or hyper-local um, distribution of fish. You know, maybe you see it with, with um, vegetables or produce, but we don't really have that up here in upstate. Once you get out of the city, you don't really see it all that much. And the startups are very expensive and they're very risky. Seafood processing, there's various techniques employed. 
And right now in New York, we don't have a lot of them. And you're going to hear from someone on the panel that has issues with getting access to processing. Poor understanding of market desire. We don't really know where, like, where, where do we put the money? Where do we put the processing money right now? Do we need more fish cutters? Do we need more post-processing? Do we need canneries? Do we need smokehouse? What do we need? It, it's, it's very hard to understand what we're looking for. And it's very complicated. Like I said, that's a big gap between the fish and the consumer to have to stick processing into. Cold chain management is a big issue. Once it's frozen, it's got to stay frozen. So, I mean, we had that problem during the pandemic with vaccines, you know, so you can freeze a great fish and, and a frozen fish could be great to use, but it's got to stay frozen and that can cost money and that can limit the uh, availability of it. And then the position of the, in the supply chain and the value added propositions in seafood processing create just other levels of complexity to what you might end up doing. The wholesaling or the distribution networks Outside of the city, there's not much, but even in the city, it's pretty mature, but it's pretty antiquated. You go down there and you have people with fish on ice in boxes and it goes and it goes in trucks and it goes to restaurants and everything. It's great for freshness, great for actually be able to see it, but it hasn't really changed much since the fish market moved from Manhattan up to the Bronx. They're starting to use more technology and we had some talks in the past about ways of getting fish or from the boat out to the consumer, out to the wholesaler uh, with more efficiency so that they can keep more value, you know, with the farmer or the fisherman. But we're, we're not, we're just not there yet. It's, it's not, it's not a very hyper technical space. It's hard to break into it. A lot of these facilities or families have been running these uh, distribution networks for a very long time. It's hard to start a brand new one. I actually have a friend who's trying to start a brand new fish purveyance uh, from, uh, from Burlington, Vermont, Boston to Burlington. And he's starting from scratch. So stay tuned. Maybe we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, and again, the position in the sp supply chain here is pretty rigid. It's, it's pretty much where it is um, without, much, without much movement. Retail, we're seeing more people eating seafood in the United States. The numbers are going up. The model at retail is relatively fixed. You walk into a place and there's a glass case with fish on ice. Um, maybe the quality looks good. Maybe the quality doesn't look good. It's not necessarily, hasn't been much innovation in that space in a long time. Um, and then the changes in consumer desire and access to desired product is very difficult. If someone wants a fish and they can't get it, well, then that might be it. That may have, that may have been your one chance to expose someone to a new product. And then on the consumer side, again, more people are eating it. People generally have pretty mature tastes um, and they're pretty fixed. But that seems to be growing a little bit. But I mean, I think, you know, most of us in this room understand that right now it seems to be the age of the salmon, no matter what other fish is out there and great. Everybody wants a salmon for whatever reason. Um, there's ethical and moral concerns with, and welfare issues that, that the consumer has that if they learn more, maybe they would understand or maybe they, it, would, it would abate some of those concerns. But again, like Bruce was saying, um, and when Corey was saying proximity to the, the grower or the fisherman can be really important in, in telling that story. And then again, supply chain issues, you know, having people have access and exposure to it. It, it can be, it just can be very difficult if you're not in one of those seafood hubs. And again, I might be telling you something you already know, but it took me 10 years to learn this. So we created an integrated seafood science curriculum back in 2018, where we took college level students, and we put them out with producers, we put them out with a processor, we put them out with fishermen for a whole summer, and they had direct engagement with the industry so they could gain an in-depth understanding of a single aspect of it. And then we took them into the classroom on weekends over the summer so we could synthesize all of that with the rest of the group and expose them to experts in all those different areas. We ran this program once, and if anybody out in the audience has any way to help us run this program again, I'll, I will speak for Mike. We'd love to run it again. It was a great program. We had a great time interacting with the students. The producers really liked it. And we have, you know, we're trying to come up with ways to be able to fund it through the producers or through um, academic partners or whatever, but everybody seemed to really find something great in this. So you could be on an oyster farm for an entire summer, but you still can learn about what it's like to be a wild capture fisherman or working in a smokehouse. It was a great program and I'm really proud of what we were able to do. I'm gonna skip right through this one. This is the summit. When I look at it in its entirety, I'm, I'm sometimes taken aback by it from where we started Stony Brook around that little tiny table with 17 people to what we have in front of you today. And we had over hundred people um, in Riverhead, New York. So again, very proud of the work we've done on the summit. It's been uh, a labor of love, but on top of that, we've created great connections for ourselves. Um, we're hopefully creating great connections for you, and we want to be there uh, as a resource for you. So again, feel free to reach out to anybody that's involved in the summit, and hopefully we can help you uh, in future endeavors.
Another project that I worked on for a couple of years on and off um, that was very interesting, uh, we, we st we're still sitting on a bunch of data, so we haven't really published this yet, was we did this fish welfare project with a, with a group called the Aquatic Life Institute. They're a nonprofit fish welfare group. We put together a project that I was very interested in doing was trying to figure out what the sentiment of farmers is around welfare. When you say welfare to a fish farmer, what does it mean to them? Does it mean the same thing that you think it means or not? What are the actions that the fish farmers take that they believe are impacting welfare, right? When, when people, when consumers or the public think about welfare and think about what farmers are doing, it turns out that they're not the same, right? The farmers are out there doing certain things that they believe are welfare, but we might call it husbandry. We might call it something else. And they believe that they are doing the right thing. They are creating great environments for them. And they're just not having the right conversations. So where does that come? Where does that harmony come from, right? You need to find the harmony between the combination of what the producer's sentiment is and what they're doing. And then you have to have these critical conversations. Again, I think this was said almost verbatim, an openness to engage. That is critical to trying to figure out where the consumer is and where the farmer is on, on these very um, sensitive topics. And then what were we going to do? The whole point of this project was to try and drive it with data. Let's find out what we don't know. Let's find out where the gaps are. Let's find out why a farmer thinks they are doing a welfare thing, but the consumer thinks they're not because there has to be a reason for that. And then we need to educate on that in both directions, right? And in an attempt to close the gap. So hopefully we can find some students or someone that might have a little bit of time so we can process some of this data. I don't mind, I don't mind having a culinary student process fish welfare data. So if you're interested, let me know. I'm gonna close out with this. Uh, I'm coming up on time, but these are my last two, these are my last two slides. This is a project I spent, I spent the last two years, uh, year and a half or so working on. I partnered with this company, Blue Cove Preserves or Blue Cove Fish. We have some of their product in the back. Uh, there are two types of canned Bronzino. Um, and what we did was we put together a project to apply for the Grow New York business competition here in New York. If we won, we would have won a million dollars. And what we would have done is we would have brought a fish cannery, an artisanal fish cannery, to New York State. Our plan was to use domestic products processed domestically, and even more, my real interest is using New York State products processed in New York. Artisanal, high-end canned fish right here in New York. That was our whole plan. You'll get to taste a product out there. It's a farmed Mediterranean sea bass, which is grown in Connecticut, then it has to get frozen, and then it has to get flown to Washington State. Then it goes to Chicago, and then it's how it gets distributed. So the sustainability of that process, I think, is clear to everybody, right? If we could, if we could make that more hyper-regional, that, that truly then becomes a much more sustainable product. And you can be the judge of the flavors. So what is the tin fish, right? I think everybody pretty much here kind of gets an idea of what it is. It's really a preservation technique. It's a shelf-stable food. It's non-perishable. It can help us with some of those issues, especially in... Um, you know, food insecurity, you know, you can keep it out for, uh, for a number of years before it, you know, I'm sure, I mean, we, I think we've seen fish now that's been kept for over 20 years, you know, as long as it's, as long as it keeps, uh, we keep an eye on it. The cans are recycled, well, it's highly nutritious, right? But it really deals with some of those supply chain issues because you don't have to freeze it, you don't have to refrigerate it, right? And if it's, if it's prepared appropriately, the quality can be very, very good. Um, and some of the cans that are out there now, they're selling for over $20 a can for a six ounce can or a three and a half ounce can. So people are buying, people are buying this product. And then again, what's the challenge that we're trying to address? It's exactly this. We're shipping fish from Connecticut to Washington state. I mean, come on. I think we all get the problem there. You know, we don't have any of these canneries here on the East Coast and that's something that we really want to do. So this is something I've been working on for about a year and a half. It'll probably take up another year and a half of my time uh, to see where, where we go with it. And with that, uh, I want to thank you for listening to my journey, um, of which the Seafood Summit has really been a, a critical part. And if you have any further questions, I'll be around till the end. And um, my contact information is here and on the slides. So I appreciate your time and attention. And I'm going to turn it back over to me. Mike will have to do the computer part of it because he wasn't here to figure out how we were doing it. And let's see, we are.
Any questions yeah, for Steve? We do, yeah, we do have time for probably one. Yep. Hi. Um, suppose sustainability uh, becomes a popular demand for consumers, and it also becomes an economic implication for fishermen and their communities. Uh, what would the role of aquaculture in sustainability be, and how would that affect the seafood business? So I think everybody heard the question. I think it's a very, it's a very, it's a complicated question. It has a lot of different answers. Um, but what I'm hearing is, what's the role of aquaculture um, if sustainability becomes important to the consumer? I, I, I'm going to approach it in, in two ways. One, I'm not sure we know what sustainability means. I think there was a time when sustainability meant something in a, in a very particular way. And now I think the term is very loose. If what it means is to allow us to have a product into the future for future generations and not deplete it and not destroy it, then I, you know, then maybe we can talk about that. And I think aquaculture has a role to play there. But I think the real role, and, and this, is, this has come from many years of the summit and everything, I think the real role of aquaculture is to increase accessibility to seafood products for people, right? Because you can create aquaculture in places that might be a little more local or a little closer to the sources where people want it. But I don't think it's meant to compete with wild catch fisheries. I think they're, they're meant to be additive to each other because the products are very different, right? And their impact on the environment is also very different. I don't think we have time to get into all of the different impacts that either of them have, but I see them as being additive in a broader seafood ecosystem. You do one more question. I promise I'll be fast. If not, then all right, I'd like to invite down Sue Wicks. Sue is a farmer and the owner of Violet Cove Oysters. <laughs> Although I know that's not exactly the, uh, the topic. Do we have a presentation? Oh, no presentation. All right, well then, yeah. Sue, take it away. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. So I am an oyster farmer and a kelp farmer on Long Island. Um, so I guess farmers should tell their story where they come from and how they got to do this because I guess I'm selling part of myself and what I am is part of a fishing family. For 400 years, my family's been on Long Island as early settlers here and always on the water. I grew up on my father's boat um, and we caught everything. My father was a lobsterman. We did eels and crabs and clams and oysters, everything in the season. And my father could do everything. And I love that. It was, it was, um, you mentioned that um, sometimes farmers aren't articulate. And I have to say every, my father and every man that I worked or saw him work with was a poet without words. The beauty and their place on earth was on that water. And I, it resonated with me and it felt like it was in my blood. When I was a senior in high school, I got a scholarship to play basketball at Rutgers University. And then I played professionally in Europe and Asia. And then finally in the WNBA. And when I played in Europe, um, I certainly asked my agent to always have me next to a body of water. That was always, it wasn't a major city. I didn't have to be in a major city. I needed to be next to a body of water. That was the most important criteria, even in my um, basketball. So then some years passed and um, I turned 50 years old. I came out to Long Island. My father had moved to North Carolina because it was a little bit easier to work there with the oysters and the clams. Um, my brother said, oh, I had an oyster farmer ask me to do a survey of his farm. And I was like, what? An oyster farm on Long Island? Um, he gave me his number. I met that guy that night. He said, you should, you should do this. And um, he showed me how to do the application. I put in my application that night. I mean, I, I started to fill it out. It took more than that night. It took a long time to do it, but I started the process. 
Very soon, I sold my apartment in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and bought a house on Long Island so I could be next to the water and bought a boat and started a new life um, being an oyster farmer. I, um, the process of doing an application for an oyster farm took two years. And during that two years, yes, it's a very long application for them to pass that. There's about seven agencies that have to look over your um, application. The Army Corps of Engineers, they wanna know every detail of that farm. The Coast Guard wants to know, the DEC wants to know, there is uh, Marine Resources wants to know. And what I learned during that time, doing all that research is how to be an oyster farmer and how to set up a farm because they asked me so many questions I would have never thought about. And because oyster farming was new, I couldn't ask my father for resources. He told me um, the best place to have an oyster farm. He told me the history of where I was on Long Island. He's like, oh, there used to be a clam farm there. Your oysters are right next to this inlet that's gonna flush it clean. And oh, by the way, there's a freshwater spring over here in front of Terrells County Park and there's no septic. Now this is a farmer or a bayman that's not very articulate, but he knew that the bottom of that and the space and what we were dealing with better than any scientist probably at Cornell or anywhere else, you know, because that is his life. It moves through him, his blood. What he knows is that place. So I asked my father and he was a great, great resource for that. Um, I learned how to be an oyster farmer by doing it. There's no other way to do it. And it's a mistake after mistake and learn and do better, do better. So that's how we got there. Um, then the kelp came. Um, Stony Brook University asked if I would like participate in a study. They were doing um, number one, shallow water kelp farming. And part of it was let's do it on an oyster farm and see how these two um, organisms interact together. The thought was the kelp is gonna pull some of these abundant nutrients out of the water there are kind of, um, and some of it phosphorus, nitrogen, these things that might have been slowing the growth of the oysters, the condition of the water, adding oxygen back in the water through photosynthesis. So there were so many great things. And I was like, yeah, I'd love to do it. It's a native grass. Um, it, it's not a grass, it's a um, micro um, algae. So it's not a grass, it's mycoalgae, it's native to this area. So I was like, yes, I would like to do that. These oysters are native, I wanna plant them there. And as far as sustainability, 100%, no chemicals, no feed, jet, no fresh water. They just grow there, they eat what's in the water and you take them out. So 100%, we try and sell everything locally. Um, I am the first kelp farmer commercially licensed in New York state. And I think that um, it was a very, also another long process. Um, when it got to the Army Corps of Engineers, they were like, listen, we, we don't know. No one in the office knows how to do this. We don't know what could go wrong. And that's their thing. They wanna safeguard that something can go wrong. So another two years before I got my permit, I had an experimental permit to grow kelp on my farm and we grew quite a bit and um, I donated that or sold it to farms, organic farmers, um, Macari Vineyard, um, the largest vineyard on Long Island is a biodynamic farmer and he used it for his vines. Um, the other part of my crop I ate um, and I loved it. I was shocked that I loved it so much. It was one of those things like, oh, seaweed, I don't know about this, how this is gonna go, but I better try it because I know it's great for the environment. I wanna grow it maybe for soil amendment on Long Island, but I ate that kelp that I, I either pickled or dried um, for months. It was, it was so fantastic. And I would give it to my friends thinking, oh, they're, they're not gonna eat this. They asked me for more after a week. So it was one of those things, we did it very simply, um, easy capizzi, we baked it into bread. We did it, um, like I said, pickled it, um, dried it and sprinkled it on our fish. Um, so as many ways that we could think of, we made soups with it and never got bored with it. We were in love with it. So kelp, I am, um, I have about 
40 lines, 100 foot lines of kelp on my farm right now. Um, that should be about 50,000 pounds. It grows extraordinarily well where I am um, because of the current and the nitrogen that it uses to grow and also pulls that out of the water. So all of those great benefits. Um, so I'm very enthusiastic about it. There are a lot of um, challenges ahead for us because we have to create markets. So that's where we need chefs to be innovative and think about this as a food um, and how we can present this and sell this because it's nutritious, it's abundant, 100% sustainable, and it's so good for the environment. So those, those pluses are all over the map. Um, I think in the world, the US probably has 1% of the, um, the seaweed market that's projected to grow to astronomical numbers in the next five to 10 years. And so as a New Yorker who has a long history on Long Island and has watched a lot of the fisheries diminish, it's very exciting to be in aquaculture, to think that the next generation of my family and everybody else that works on the water and can't live without being on the water, that type of person will have an opportunity to grow kelp, to grow oysters, to grow other things and continue that attachment to the water and the food. So I'll just say one of the, the greatest things that happened being an oyster farmer was I, I grew all the oysters and I know how I was gonna sell them. So the wholesalers weren't interested right away because they had their people. So I took a bag of oysters and I started knocking on restaurants, restaurant doors, the back doors, um, thinking the chef would always be too busy. So I was nervous to go knock on the door. I was greeted with such enthusiasm and passion. And I, you, I'm sure you know what a kitchen is like because you're in them and now um, everything is flying around. My experience has never been a chef like come back tomorrow or this. They stopped what they were doing because they wanted to see that oyster that I had just brought from the sea and they wanted to know the farmer. They wanted to know what the water was like where I was. They cracked them open right away when you eat them. Um, and that um, feedback, that interaction, that animal that I was so connected to that I loved and nurtured and grew and nobody else knew about. No one was like an oyster farm, what are you doing? My first connection was with a chef and their enthusiasm and love for what I had and their curiosity of how I, I grew this product and talked to me about the oyster with their refined palates telling me the profile that I didn't even check these nuances or, or was, you know, was accessible to me. So it was that connection between a chef and a farmer is, it goes back and forth that we sustain one another and there's a passion there. So through the years doing this, I probably had about 10 chefs on my farm that um, take the day off to come out on the farm and work on the farm and see where these oysters are, are, are coming from. So it's been, that's been a delight, the passion, you know, we all love food, I think in this room. And for me as a farmer, it made me a better farmer because the feedback I got from my chefs, can you go with that a little bit um, bigger? Can you make that, a little, you know, deliver it a little smaller? those different things um, and, and checking it throughout the year. So the feedback, the communication, I could have never gotten from anybody else. So th that connection is so important. So I think that's pretty much um, everything. I talked about the kelp. I'm really pushing and hoping to have success with my crop this year so that other oyster farmers become involved. I mean, we're all so busy. Um, everyone wants to diverse their crop and have other flows of income. And I think we're all um, interested in the environmental impacts that are all around us. And we wanna mitigate a lot of them. And sugar kelp is one of those animals or organisms that can help us mother nature if we help it just a little bit cleaning our waterways and making it safer. So eat more kelp if you can. Um, does anybody have any questions?
Hi. Um, I, you said that you were a kelp farmer, yes? Uh, I was wondering, since kelp doesn't have any uh, roots, stems, or leaves, uh, how does kelp transport like photosynthesis in its blades? Great question. So the kelp has, we get the kelp from a hatchery. We'll get it, um, they'll, they'll do a wild harvest. They'll take some of the reproductive, I guess, what do you call it, spores. Um, they, they take that in the hatchery. And in the hatchery, they grow them on twine, like rolls of um, string. And they just grow to a, a certain length. And from that, those little babies that are barely just microscopic still, I take them and I put them on a 100 foot long line. The oyster, I mean, the kelp from that piece of twine has a hold fast and the hold fast grows and it goes into that long rope. So there is a hold fast. It does, um, I don't, you don't have to call it a root system. It's not in the bottom like an eelgrass that it's that, but it is holding on to the rope. And then the photosynthesis is, it's the entire um, leaf is photosynthesis. I mean, if we wanted to study solar power, um, I think you could start right there. It's the perfect um, organism that's pulling all the sun and all these nutrients out of the water and it grows so fast, like from week to week, starting now from March, April, May, it, it seems to grow a foot or two every two weeks which is you could probably watch it grow. That's how fast it's growing during March when that sun, when we get the full sun again, it's an explosive, beautiful growth. And even though I didn't have a market for it the last two years, um, as a farmer, even as a businesswoman, I can't tell you how much time I spent in my kelp lines, just enjoying it. It made me feel um, childlike and happy, the abundance of it in a world that, you know, we, we talk about the diminishing fisheries to watch this grow so abundantly was exhilarating for me. So it's a very fast growing plant um, and it's beautiful how it moves in the water. So I, I mean, I'm gonna tell you, I'm in love with it. So that's how it works. Great question. So there's different, um, right now, is a great time to harvest it. It's almost like it's baby spinach. Um, it's tender and delicious right now for food consumption. This is a great time for food. At the end of its life cycle, when it's like at maximum um, bulk, we do that one because it gets rough, like an asparagus or something like that. It'll get woody, the, the flavor changes, the, um, the leaf changes. So it's, it has a life cycle, just like a vegetable, um, it changes. So right now the tender, beautiful, like baby spinach taste. And then by the time um, I left some in all the way to the end to see until it fell off the hold fast into the water. And that's gonna occur probably mid June towards July. And that is, um, it's not even, even very good anymore for fertilizer because it becomes so, it falls apart too easily and it even escapes. So the best time to harvest for the bulk, the maximum growth would be probably the end of May, June. I'm gonna have a big, beautiful crop. And then right now is a wonderful time to have, to start, like if we were gonna have a kelp festival in New York, you could start in March, and go to April and have this beautiful kelp in your restaurants and serve it um, with your fish, steam your fish on top of your fish, um, any type of way. But I, I right now, perfect, um, moving into perfect food time. Um, where would somebody start if they wanted to pursue um, like in the oyster farming industry? How do you become an oyster farmer? Yeah, basically. yeah, yeah. So there are some programs for sure on Long Island. We have the um, Suffolk County Aquaculture. That's the Baconic Bay. Um, I think that also extends into the Great South Bay. I belong to, um, because Long Island's so old, the, the bottom of the water belongs to different people. Sometimes people own their own water rights. 
So my water that I wanted to be in, that was my hometown that I got to go where I used to fish with my father, belongs to the town of Brookhaven. They started their aquaculture program probably in 2013. And the farmer that's next to me that I told you about the permit is a very clever man, also from Cornell, that um, helped them codify their program. So he was he had enough foresight to say, let's include macroalgae just in case we do that down the road. So identifying um, where you wanna grow your oysters, number one, and then um, doing a little research, does that belong to Suffolk County aquaculture? Does that belong to the Brookhaven? And then contacting, so I had to contact my councilman and gave him a proposal for um, requesting that we have a resolution first. And then they put it before a board and say, does anybody have any problems with her doing an oyster farm here? And they're like, no, okay. So then as soon as they sign the resolution, I can then um, request the application. That's what I did. I've requested them. And then you go through all the series that they approve them. And the final one is the DEC um, on Long Island sent me my permit. But it took a while um, for everyone to agree because it's, um, it's bureaucratic and not every uh, agency agrees with every other agency and who's responsible for what. So sometimes you get caught in that cycle. So streamlining that with national permitting should be happening, but it's a little slow. Um, it's not how they um, promised it would be quite yet, but it will be that hopefully you can get a permit in a viable spot in six months, maybe someday. <laughs> the New York Sea Grant has an online course that walks you through the process as well and the variety of options. Uh, so I'm not sure if I missed it, but when you did incorporate kelp growth into your oyster farm, did it have any noticeable effect on the growth or quality on your oysters? So my data sample so far is um, I don't know that I have enough. Um, I, I actually have such a great growing spot already. Um, but Stony Brook does collect the data. They go back to their lab. And the things that they're looking for is because of um, coastal acidification, that um, has made oysters, the wild growth of oysters, very difficult in our water. Just the juveniles are so tender and fragile, they, they don't seem to be um, propagating themselves well. So we use a hatchery. So the hatchery is the first part of that. Um, and then the kelp grown alongside of them should help with coastal acidification by pulling the phosphorus, the nitrogen, these other things out of the water that cause the pH levels to be out of balance, that cause those little tiny animals to have a very hard time when they're tiny babies and they're so fragile. So aquaculture has helped us step over that for you know fragile state of oysters. But wouldn't it be lovely if we could get them to propagate again, even as an oyster farmer, if it would put me out of business, I promise you I would be in heaven to know that wild oysters grew in that spot where they belong again. Or quick question, um, and then we'll go on to our next presentation, but Sue will be on our panel later and she will also be able to answer questions then. Hi, you said that uh, the US represents 1% of the seaweed market and it's supposed to grow in popularity. Have you had the chance to partner with any packaged food retailers that are consumer facing or could you even handle that with the size of the kelp? Where's farmer? my question coming from? Oh, right here. So it, we are brand new. It is, this is really the beginning, the beginning, the beginning. Um, I will tell you how I wanna do it. And this is the promise I make to myself that I will sell my kelp locally. Um, I wanna do it right on Long Island in New York City. I think when we talk about sustainability, moving a product like kelp to Maine or another place to process it defeats part of my personal mission or belief. And it may be slow going because there are a lot of challenges creating markets. I mean, that's what a big thing we're talking about today, processing. We don't have working waterfront. I'm working with our municipality 
now to just have a drying area of waterfront, I don't know if you guys know this, but Long Island's super expensive. I cannot afford to buy a waterfront area um, to dry my kelp. But we're at a point that the county, um, Suffolk County is like, we need to clean our water and this is amazing and we will help you do this. But it still is a lot of um, hurdles to jump over, a lot of legislation, a lot of agreements and um, things like that to get that there. So I, I feel just, you know, I'm very mission driven on the kelp and doing a lot of work um, like today, I should be on my oyster farm, but I wanted to come up here and talk to you guys about kelp because I believe in kelp. Um, so I'm gonna keep pushing. I'm gonna um, probably talk to New York Certified about grants. I'm gonna talk to Sea Grant about grants. And it is because I believe in kelp so strongly that it's gonna help my oysters, it's gonna help the water and the possibility for a great industry on Long Island um, based on seafood could be born out of this. And um, certainly this group of people in this room are will be instrumental in that the uh, you know people eating kelp and we need to present it and that we need chefs to be super creative with it um and courageous with it too and adventurous um so that's that's where we're at we're right at the beginning we're right there um i've certainly had um co-ops um and groups ask for my kelp out of state but I'd rather give it to Macari Vineyards to put in our Long Island soil, to bring that soil back to life. I'd rather give it to an organic farmer than sell it somewhere else for 10 times the value because that defeats what I believe the true power of that kelp is. One more question up here. Hi, uh, forgive my lack of knowledge of terminology. I know of uh, biodiversity in farming, specifically aqua where you said kelp and oysters. Uh, do you grow other things? And I know regarding this, if you're looking at the depth, you have the surface and the, the floor of the ocean, and at certain level, you the oysters and possibly mussels and kelp, and they all help each other. And you have a thriving ecosystem that helps clean the water, clean our environment, clean our world. What can you say to other products besides oysters and kelp? Are you looking to do more? That's a great question. Please, so I am open to all of those things. I'm open to doing um, the different farming together. That's adding oysters, then adding um, the kelp. I have tried to do the, um, the wild um, um, mussels. I grab them when there's hundreds of thousands of them and put them in little socks and try and grow them. But my observation is this, since I've been on my farm, the biodiversity, is um, I can see it. I see it right in front of me because the oyster cages, I am in a spot where the um, eelgrass is gone, which is a meadow, which is a nursery for all these little animals. When I was a little girl working with my father, that was the scariest place in the world because it was filled with eels and horseshoe crabs and um, blue claw crabs and eels that would just go through my legs and I would scream in there like a little girl. Now I can walk when I started my farm completely barren, like the Sierra desert, no life at all, not one green thing there. I did not see the fish that, you know, they would swim through certainly, but it was not a nursery. And you need that nursery for these animals to survive. You need a nursery for peconic scallops to survive. You need all of these things to occur. So from the beginning till now, Inside of my oyster bags is a nursery. There's little animals in there constantly eating my oysters and um, you know whatever they're filtering out, there's other animals in there eating it. So every time we see that, um, I have to say, we stop and pause with delight and study what's in that bag. We're not naming it, but we're like, this is new, this is different, isn't this exciting? So biodiversity, um, we, 100% believe that is um, the other key to healing our waters. And oysters and sugar kelp are cornerstone species to help this occur. So 
we believe in that, yes, in diversity. Um, so I'll have my two crops and then I'll let mother nature keep adding more and making this is like a nice little halo effect of goodness in the water there. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. And Sue will be back on our panel later, so you'll have time for more questions. All right. Now that we know that kelp is coming to New York, we wanted to have someone come to speak to the culinary applications of seaweeds. Um, there are many chefs and future chefs in the room, and I'm sure you're very aware of the various fires that happen in kitchens. Uh, unfortunately, Chef Emily Mingrown from the Tavern on State could not join us in person today to speak to the culinary applications of seaweeds, but she was kind enough to record her presentation for us, and we want to play that for you now. If you have questions, follow up with me.
Sorry, Chef Emily could not join us today, but if you have questions specific for Chef Emily, please reach out to me and I'll get uh, you guys in touch with her. But Steve's gonna take it away. We're gonna start our panel now. All right. So I'm gonna invite our panelists down. Uh, got Sue, Steve, Gower, Kristen and Barry. I'll keep you in suspense about the rest of their names. Move. Oh, they can pivot the camera. Oh, okay. We should be good then. Then they started. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. We don't see, we don't see Gower. Uh, I heard that we can move the camera. Let's see. Oh, she's not in there right now. Yeah. Um, I'm going to slide down this way. We'll move down. I'm monitoring it up here. Ah, we got it. Okay. Nailed it. All right. Well, I'm going to let everybody go ahead and introduce themselves. And seeing as Barry has the microphone, we will start with him. Is it alive? Yes. All right. Hi everyone, Barry Udelson, aquaculture specialist with New York Sea Grant. Uh, my role is to help support and enhance the aquaculture industry throughout the state of New York. This does include uh, shellfish, macroalgae, and finfish aquaculture. Hello, my name is Steve Pomerlow. I'm the manager at Nuponics, which is an aquaponic facility in central New York, in central New York, in the Finger Lakes area. And I'll be glad to discuss more about our facility shortly. I'm Sue Wicks from Violet Cove Oysters in East Mauritius, Long Island. We grow oysters and sugar kelp. Hi, I am Kristen Gerbino. I'm a fishery specialist at Cornell Cooperative Extension. And Cornell does a lot of uh, research and other projects working closely with the commercial fishing industry. And I oversee the Choose Local Fish initiative. Hi, my name's Gower Lane and I get to oversee the purchasing and procurement and storeroom operations at all four campuses of the Culinary Institute. You can hold on to that. <laughs> so, this panel was put together to discuss challenges with local seafood and processing and what other, other problems there may be. So I had supplied them with four questions that they were able to take a look at. So we'll ask some of those questions um, just to kind of set the stage. And hopefully if there's some time, we'll be able to take questions from the audience. So I'll allow anybody to answer, but since Gower has the microphone, he'll have the first chance to pass it off. So the first question that I want the panel to, to, to think about is, um, we'd like you to describe your current methods of seafood procurement and or purveyance. So how do you get it? How do you give it? And what are some of the critical factors that you consider when uh, developing those, those methods, such as source, quality, sustainability, et cetera? So at the culinary, our purchasing of seafood is based on your curriculum. It's, we basically supply the needs of all the kitchens and the restaurants at the culinary. Uh, we source our seafood from multiple vendors uh, coming out of the Bronx, uh, the Hunts Point area, um, Boston, we get seafood from. So we get from quite a different, uh, multiple areas and we really see no challenges in our procurement of seafood, especially after COVID like we did with every other product, but seafood seemed to stay pretty, pretty steady, whether it was frozen or fresh product. So at Cornell, we are primarily um, providing education and outreach about um, the availability of local seafood on Long Island. So we don't deal, we are not doing um, any purveying ourselves. However, we do facilitate 
the connections between the fishermen, the processors, wholesalers, um, any industry members that we can connect to ensure that local seafood is more accessible to consumers and to restaurants, that is our role. So as an oyster farmer and the kelp, I get the babies, the seed um, from local, from Long Island. So it's genetically the best disease resistance um, um, for this area. It's appropriate for the water temperature and the brood stock that it's coming from is going to do very well here. If we got it from out of state, we'd go up north. We wouldn't get something from a lower region because different um, temperatures and also possibility of transporting diseases and things like that, that uh, might be in our waters or their waters. So we everything we try and keep local. Um, because kelp is brand new, we have um, one hatchery. So I get all of my kelp from um, Hart um, Hatchery doing the kelp um, and they're in West Sable, New York. So we look for, and it's by reputation, the best seed possible, the starting with the best brood stock, um, the best oysters that have been brewed together over, you know, years to get the best possible, healthiest, fast growing, appropriate for your water, oysters and kelp. At the Nuponics, our aquaponic facility specialize in uh, the production of tilapia. And um, so the tilapia is grown in a recirculating, indoor recirculating system. We acquire our tilapia fry from uh, out of state, from a hatchery in New Mexico, and they ship those fries overnight in a cooler. Um, then those, those fish are grown at our facility and um, and the water, the, the nutrient rich water that's produced through our, the culture of the tilapia is used to fertigate uh, plants, which are cannabis. So we fertigate our cannabis plants with our fish nutrient rich water from the fish. Uh, currently we uh, raise, we grow uh, CBD hemp, but uh, with the, the, um, the uh, with the, but we wish to acquire an adult marijuana license soon uh, for, for our facility. As far as the tilapia is concerned, uh, we chose tilapia because it's a very hardy fish. It's uh, very convenient to us. It, it adapts well to aquaponic uh, cultivation systems. Ironically, um, when I, um, I used to work in cooperative extension and assist farmers uh, developing business plans for their new aquaculture business. And one of the main thing I used to tell farmers, prospective farmers, is uh, make sure you don't grow what's convenient to you, but what the market demands. And um, in our case, we, I did not follow my own advice. And um, so we ended up growing tilapia, which doesn't have a great uh, market in New York State. Um, and our, our volumes are very small. So the, the focus of our facility is to produce the cannabis. That's a primary product. Our secondary product is the tilapia, but it's very small quantities. So we're looking at maybe a thousand pounds a month um, to uh, up to possibly uh, three or 4,000 pounds a month. But currently just last year was our first year where we harvested, we only produced 2000 pounds. So it's, it's gonna be, we, we will slowly increment our production. So one of the challenges with our finding our a market for our tilapia is um, our initial goal was to donate the tilapia to food banks, to local food banks. Uh, so we reached out to Food Link, which is a nonprofit organization in Rochester. And uh, we're like, okay, we, we produce this tilapia. We would like to donate to local food banks. How could we make that happen? And they said, well, you need, a, you need to have your fish processed and packaged. And, and hopefully frozen before we can supply that to food banks. So that was a hurdle that we had not anticipated. So I started looking around for processing plants and um, made some contact with processing plants in Buffalo. And um, nobody really is interested in processing our fish. The volume is not large enough. And um, so we looked at if we could pay the processing plants to process our products. So after that, we could just donate it to food banks. Uh, we tried to have, you know, donate some product to the processing plants. They could process and then give us back some 
a percentage of that product for us to donate, but uh, it's just too much uh, trouble for those processing plants to, to deal with our product. So um, ideally we'd like to find a processor that could process small quantities on an irregular basis, and also that could maybe produce a shelf stable product for us. So <clears throat> I'm going to answer these questions from what I've learned from the aquaculture industry members. Um, I am not actually producing things, but based on industry needs assessment and interactions. So I'm going to, Sue and Steve are also able to address some specifics. So I might talk in general or terms. Um, most of the fin fish hatcheries are getting their juveniles or their fry from out of state hatcheries. There are some that are spawning their own um, New York shellfish industry. There are several shellfish hatcheries producing, um, but there's not enough to fill the needs for all the shellfish growers. Um, many of the growers, fin fish or shellfish, once they have produced their product, they're distributing them in a variety of ways. Some are doing online sales, but many are more local to consumers. Some are to restaurants. There are a few options to do wholesalers, but they do have issues with competing with other stuff coming from imports. So uh, a lot of the growers are producing on a, on a smaller scale and trying to distribute their stuff closer to home um, since that's where they're able to get an easier market. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to pass it back down here to Gower. Um, I was, I was taken by the, the response you got. I mean, not, I mean, I kind of expected it, but I have a follow-up kind of question. Um, so you had mentioned that you don't really have a lot of issues procuring seafood and that's based on the curriculum and you have lots of options to, to get the seafood from. So the second question that we were going to ask everybody, and I'm, and I want to start with you on this one, cause I'm going to be a little more specific is do you consider New York a viable source or market for your products? And what are the key considerations regarding source and market access in New York? I'm going to alter that a little bit for you. And I'm going to say, do you consider New York grown or New York caught seafood to be a viable source? We do, but I'm like a restaurant. We use many types of seafood from all over in order to teach you guys. So we do get some local stuff. We do get some stuff from the Gulf of Mexico. We get stuff from the Northern Atlantic. We get seafood from the Pacific. So our seafood comes from all over the place and it's, it's truly driven on the educational needs. If we were a standalone restaurant and I was buying for it, we could easily uh, menu lo more local fish and be able to procure it that way. But because of the education needs, we buy a wide variety of, of seafood items. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, that's actually very good. Thank you. Um, we'll go down the line. You can answer as long or as short as you'd like. Yes. Yeah, so, um, like I said, Cornell Cooperative Extension has their Choose Local Fish initiative. And FISH is an acronym for Fresh, Indigenous, Sustainable, and Healthy. And through that initiative, we try to raise awareness and increase demand for all the local seafood options that we have to offer in New York. Uh, I am on Long Island, so when most of the fishing activity is taking place on Long Island, but we are trying to um, make sure that this um, very active and vibrant fishing community uh, is known about throughout the rest of the state. So in New York, there's 18.5 million pounds of uh, seafood landed. That was in 2022, which is the latest year available. So there is plenty of it available of, of wide range of different species. And uh, my role is to educate people about what species are local to the region, where people can purchase it. Online, we have a seafood locator of all the different uh, retail locations and farmers markets on Long Island. I know this is that we're not on Long Island right now, but um, maybe we could potentially expand it as demand for local seafood increases up in this region. And we try to teach people how to cook with it and 
uh, what to look for in a restaurant. So in so many ways, uh, I feel immersed in a very uh, active, vibrant fishing community on Long Island. And I hope that we can bring that awareness to everyone here. So yes, the oysters are local. And I, I think the oyster is um, from its place. All of the um, elements that are in the water by me, I have a farmer that's 2,000 feet away, and my oyster tastes slightly different than his. That's 2,000 feet away. That's because I have my farm juts out a little bit. There's a different current coming from the ocean. The, there's different springs underneath me. That's how sensitive oysters are to flavor. Um, all across Long Island, there are different tastes. Um, you could do a map. And you would be able to, there's farmers that know exactly um, whose oyster is whose just by tasting it. So oysters are one of those things, pride of place. This is from where I live and this is this oyster and it is part of that place um, because of the flavor it takes from its um, area. So what are some key considerations regarding the markets that you are going after when you're selling your, your products? I, I'm, I'll just say it again. I want to sell my product locally. I want um, Long Island oysters for sure for Long Island people. And because we have so many people there in the summer, we sell almost all of them um, on Long Island. We're so close to New York City. We sell them in New York City. For sure, they're going outside. My oysters are, um, especially during the um, pandemic and shutdowns, they were going to Texas. They were going down to Florida. These restaurants were open and had different standards. They needed to find a place to go. My, my choice is that they, they stay local. I don't want my oyster to be put in a truck, shipped across the country, and one week later, you have it. I'd like to deliver it right. When I harvest that day, I bring it to my chef and it's gonna be on the menu that night. And that is certainly the very best way to have a fish. And I think when we talked about that relationship with a chef, you're giving them what they want. And that's the sea, the, the beauty of that product. And that connection is not 10 days later, that is that day. And that is the most, that's the best fish, oyster um, product that you will get in the world is direct from your farmer. As a um, uh, New York state producer, we're fortunate to live in, in the state that has some of the that has the one of the largest uh, market for seafood. Um, so definitely, there's the, the demand is there for the products. We uh, and I was happy to learn today about uh, those different programs and New York grown programs, and uh, so I'll definitely look into that and try to get access try to learn more about those different programs that we have in our state to facilitate uh, the marketing of our products uh, within the state. And just to elaborate on what I said earlier, since I haven't been able to find a processor to process our fish, uh, what we ended up doing is giving our fish live right out of the, from our farm. Uh, so I just put ads in the paper and uh, for free fish giveaways and people show up on, on the, the specified specific date and time and uh, they show up with their ice chests and we, I ask them how many fish they want, and we fill their ice chests with all the fish they need, and off they go. So uh, we've had uh, like four fish giveaways this this last year, and people come back for our fish, and they're very happy with our product, and uh, and so we're happy to help the local community like this uh, by giving the fish live to to our consumers. So Steve, the question is: Is New York a viable market? Is that what? Yeah. So, do you think, yeah. Do you think it's a viable market for, uh, or a source more for, I guess for you would be more of a, a market. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm checking my notes, making sure I interpreted the question, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so definitely, yes, it is a viable market. I think from what I've heard from industry members, including, you know, some of the panel members, you know, there's, there's a variety of random roadblocks that, that are, restricting it from being even more viable for producers. You know, some of those talk about, you know, the distribution chain you had talked about, you know, not having a cannery on the East Coast, let alone in New York. Um, so I think there's, it's definitely viable. I think getting more consumers better educated about locally produced products and also 
sourcing of them would increase that viability. Um, so I'll go right, I'll go right into the next question. Cause it really kind of, you know, you're kind of dancing around it, right. Which is, um, if you could snap your fingers and have one wish granted, I mean, maybe for you, it's a dozen different wishes for all the different producers, but regarding their access to the seafood markets, like, what would that be? Like, what do you think if you were to distill it down to one particular pain point, again, it might be difficult for you, but you know, if you could do it, what do you think it would be? I was hoping to go last because I had a variety and I was hoping some would get picked off. But uh, I think as everything stands now, I think a great starting place is having a more developed aquaculture slash seafood coordinator type position in a state agency, such as like Ag and Market. I think there's, there's a variety of other issues that I think are also right up there, but I think that one kind of helps a lot of them. It starts, because right now we have our regulatory agency, the DEC. You have all of these other industries that have a source with Ag and Markets, and they have you know, tapped into various other sh marketing strains, you know, places for information for industry members to go. The seafood slash aquaculture industry doesn't really have that. And I think that would be a great starting place because that would really open up a lot more conversation and give industry members a direct place to go and to help help with the variety of other issues that are also high up there. Yeah, so I, I, I think that is worth noting, right, that we really, unlike some other states that have very robust uh, seafood economies, we don't really have a centralized oversight of it. It's, pretty, it's still pretty fractured here in New York. So when you're thinking about it, we don't necessarily have one office that you could go to to talk to someone about your seafood project or your seafood items and things like that. And I think a lot of other states have certainly beaten us to the punch on that. You know, yeah, there are a variety of other states that have similar yeah. type things. Yeah. And, and, and that goes for aquaculture and, and for the wild catch fisheries. And like, I think Gower said, he doesn't have problems getting it. Like we're, we're, we're pretty okay with that for the most part, but when it comes to the integrated nature of the industry, I think that that's, um, it's worth, it's worth noting. Yeah, right along with uh, what Barry said, um, something that would facilitate the networking or the connection in bet between all the different part of the supply chain, um, having a place to go to to make those connections um, would, would help a lot. Certainly processing, working waterfront. I mean, Long Island has transformed from our heritage is fishing. That's what we are. And now it is, you know, a playground for the rich. Um, and they they like the to look at the water, but not have um, the fishermen or the facilities there. And I think that's um, other places, whether it's Alaska or Maine or Boston, they understand the heritage and the beauty of that. And that working class person, that independent, um, autonomous fisherman, for me, is nothing could be more American or Long Island. And it's one of those um, things that um, we certainly are, I feel um, on the verge of losing. So we do need to recommit to um, our fishermen and our fisheries um, on, in New York state. And that I think first, um, yes, we need someone in aquaculture to be um, a go-to person. We need working waterfront, um, which is very expensive. Um, and we need processing. Um, the kelp is one certainly that is a crop that needs to be processed. It's big and it's bulky, and um, we have to we have to take care of that. So, I think um, with vision and passion and perseverance, all these things are possible. So, working waterfront and processing, and doubling down on our identity um, and where our food comes from and um, heritage on that is for me, very important. Yes, those are all great. Um, I would definitely stress the need for a robust New York seafood marketing um, campaign, similar to what 
other states are doing um, with significant amounts of funding. I think um, education to the culinary community is super important because so many of our restaurants uh, in New York do not have local New York fish on their menus. So there is a disconnect there. And I would love to see more education in that department for sure. And I would love to see New York's fishing industry uh, supported in the same way that the farmers are on Long Island and in New York. One, the one thing I'd like to see is more education to the larger fish distributors in New York. Um, we had an issue a few months ago, we were looking for some local fish and it was tough using our vendors out of the Bronx to get a local fish, the one we were looking for. So I think they need more education. Like you hear a lot about local produce, local produce, local produce. You don't hear a ton about local seafood. So I think there needs to be more education for the public and for distributors. Thank you. I think those are all great points to consider. Um, I'm gonna forego our fourth question and I'm gonna open it up to the audience if they have any questions for our panelists. I see we have our microphone, uh, our microphone walking away from the person that wanted it. Hello. Thank you so much. I have a question and a comment. I'll start with the question um, for Steve. So I'm really curious in seeing recirculating aquaculture systems that are true, right? You're, they're true in terms of recirculation and being able to grow um, aquaponic vegetables. And um, it's always so tricky though, right? The fish part of it is tricky. So I have two questions for you. One is, are you considering being able to grow your own fry? And then my other question is, um, what do you feed them? Uh, what's, the, what's the second question, I'm sorry? What do you feed them? So um, it would, uh, tilapia is fairly easy to, to uh, reproduce. Uh, we could do our own reproduction, but um, right now we haven't invested in, in the facility to do that. And it, it's, it's um, easy enough to just make a phone call and, and have a hatchery supply what we need you know, overnight. Um, so we haven't had the need to, to grow our own seeds, um, but it could be something we could do eventually. As, as, if our operation grow to a point where um, we could see benefit of doing that ourselves, but at this point, uh, purchasing it from another hatchery is sufficient. Um, and we feed our fish from um, uh, fish, uh, fish feed that's commercial, it's a dry pellet, it's a floating pellet that we get from a company out of Pennsylvania. And uh, I can, this is a feed I can get from my local um, farm shop. And um, so we, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's made out of a, co a corn meal and soybean meal, it's mostly uh, uh, agricultural byproducts and um, so yeah, that's what uh, we think. Thank you. Um, and then just my my comment is, <laughs> so I work with an organization called Don't Cage Our Oceans. We're a nationwide coalition of organizations and businesses that are fighting to ban industrial aquaculture while supporting and uplifting sustainable seafood systems. And so we work with chefs. We just had a webinar a couple of weeks ago um, on sourcing sustainably. We'll be having another one on procurement. Um, we also are developing an atlas to sustainable aquaculture, and we're working with um, Johns Hopkins Center for Livable Future, Grace Communication Fund, some other groups. So I'd be really curious to meet up with um, some of you about that three-year process because there's so much um, opportunity for input in developing this atlas. Um, and then we're also working with actually Senator Gillibrand in introducing legislation to ban offshore fish farms while supporting working waterfronts, which means supporting processing facilities, supporting working waterfronts for the local community to produce aquaculture that's values-based and wild fisheries. Um, and we're doing similar work with state legislators in collaboration with the State Innovation Exchange. So there are some of you that I'm really want to meet up with after this awesome panel and um yeah thank you very much for the work that you're all doing thank you 
Um, we have time for. All right. I got one question online okay, here, great. and then I think I see one more hand. Uh, two hands, and then we're going to get you guys eating, and we can continue the conversations one-on-one. Um, -on -one. All right, so our online question is, are there any kinds of verification methods or traceability tools that you see as potential or having potential value for ensuring we are actually buying local seafood and not something brought in from distant shores and branded as local? Are there tools that you might use to help identify something as truly local? Just that um, people develop a relationship with way, where they are purchasing their seafood from. Um, I know that there are some initiatives to ensure more traceability, but it, it isn't easy. Um, but a good fish purveyor should know where the fish is coming from. So never stop asking questions. And every one of your questions um, lets them know that you care about where the fish that you're eating comes from. Um, if you want more local seafood, um, ask for it and ask for it over and over again so that they realize this is what the customer wants. And wherever you can, yes, develop that relationship and and always, um, you know, dig deep to try to find out the answers that you want. So that's inter that's an interesting question, right? Because at the summit in the past, we've had some people come and talk about technological approaches to the traceability of the seafood. And I mean, I think I think you can kind of see the a bit of the silliness if you were to ask any of the people up here, how do you determine whether it's what you say it is, I mean, Sue's going to hand you a bag of oysters right out of the water. I mean, can, can you not tell the difference, right? Or, or Steve's going to deliver you the tilapia immediately. It becomes a lot easier when you're doing it locally, but when you start dealing with imports or more commercialized um, logistics, then you start to have real issues about tracking that traceability. And maybe that's where some of the um, technology comes in. But I think when you're talking about local and highly regional products it's a little bit it's a little bit different it really is about the relationships yeah. sue so the traceability um for the oyster farm we mark on our tags here's where it's coming from here's when i harvested it and because of all the guidelines you know the cold chain how it's moved has never been broken so if there is an illness that broke out somewhere at this restaurant, they're going to pull all those tags off all the bags in there, and they could be from everywhere, and they're going to go through all of that stuff. So I've been called several times about an illness outbreak, and I'm like, oh my gosh, my oysters. But then it turns out it was another oyster from somewhere else. But the, um, the DEC is very good about that food safety and that traceability and those tags that we put on there. So it's a safeguard for the public. So that is a little bit different from the other fisheries, but we are very regulated about how we, um, when we harvest that oyster and that tag goes on that bag, not just when I hand it to the person, but as soon as it comes out of the water, it's to the minute. I, I harvested this at 9.58 a.m. Immediately, I put it in um, an ice slurry. So that's how much accountability we have to give. And then when I get home, I have to do a bunch of paperwork with that. And then at the end of the month, I have to send that into the DEC. And then every month they come to my house and check all of my notes and every one of my tags and every one of my invoices. So the, the oversight on that is I need a full-time person, which I hired myself to be, <laughs> to do all that bookkeeping to ensure that you get a traceable, healthy, good product. And there are new traceability regulations coming into play in the coming years, but traceability is a hot topic in seafood and a very challenging one to address. So the, the answer is there are no tools that will solve all the issues, but there are new work and efforts to address traceability. Um, we were discussing earlier how um, kelp is reversing the effects of climate change within our oceans. And I was just wondering how does climate change affect the flavor of our seafood and the availability of it? Well, I think it, it's, 
it affects the availability of it because I think I mentioned earlier, my father was a lobsterman on Long Island. Um, there's no more lobsters, you know, that it kind of migrated and it went somewhere else. So things kind of move away for climate change as the water temperature changes. Um, as far as the taste, um, I am not quite sure, but um, fish, probably like birds, a lot of them, they can move, <laughs> which is lucky for them with climate change that they can keep moving, but it's not lucky for um, certainly the indigenous communities that cannot move from where they are to follow things and not lucky for people that wanna stay in their place and continue fishing because of climate change, those animals leave. So I cannot speak to the different change in flavor but I can tell you that Violet Cove oysters are delicious. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm curious the thoughts on my panel. Um, I'm sure at the Culinary Institute, you teach a lot about um, the end consumer, right? The end consumer you're gonna have maybe at a very fancy restaurant, um, in New York City or or one of the, the 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 target consumer there is much, much different than, you know, somebody that's maybe in a, an urban setting shopping at a shop right or, or something like that. And so much of our food supply chain, right, it has has those paths. And I, I with rural resources, we're very concerned. We want access to fresh food to everybody, not just those that can afford it. So along these lines with this product, whether it be oysters or kelp, I'm curious if you have any comments about um, the sustainability from a financial standpoint for those that would be the end consumer. The one thing that comes to mind um, is utilizing or well, learning first what species of fish I'm talking about um, might be underutilized and are locally available because those fish are often uh, very plentiful. Often they can be thrown back as bycatch, but if there's a market for them and a culinary interest, um, they can be used instead of thrown back. Um, They're often way less expensive than a lot of the more popular familiar fish. And they're also new and different. And the consumers that might be interested in trying a new novel type of seafood will definitely love them. And I feel like chefs have the ability to really make a difference when it comes to utilizing a lot of these underutilized fish and really just making them so delicious. And I'm talking about in New York, skate, um, monkfish, dogfish, sea robins. Um, there's probably a bunch of other, I can't think of right offhand, but um, they're very plentiful. They're highly sustainable. Um, there are trip limits that are you know, bigger, there, there's more available to be caught than some of the more familiar, uh, more heavily um, regulated fish. Well, I mean, they're all pretty much regulated, but some of them have very low trip limits where some of them have more wide open trip limits. Oh, scup, or porgies, that's the same thing. That's a great one too. That's highly sustainable, very plentiful. Um, so we'd really, I would suggest to the chefs, you know, get familiar with those underutilized fish. I mean, you can get them way less for way less money than some of the more popular ones. So utilizing that in a restaurant has a lot of benefits, not only to the environment, but also to uh, the price. So I'll make a comment about that too. I mean, cause you were asking about the economics, right? Like how sustainable is selling seafood, right? Because we're under the assumption that seafood is an expensive product, right? And it might be now, right? The way that the fishermen fish isn't the way that they used to fish. So they're living under a new reality. And if we could support them in a way that gets them, like Kristen is saying, support them in a way that gets them more money for the catch that they're bringing in, right? That's economically sustainable for the fishermen who are not necessarily all that sustainable right now, right? So there's that aspect of it. And if we can get them stabilized and sustainable, then that is going to 
be passed on to the consumer. And it's the same thing with the, with the fish farms, watching fish farms come into existence, spend years to, you know, become efficient and meet all their metrics and everything. Yeah. They have to sell the product at a, at, at what appears to be a increased, you know, margin, but, they, but it's not, that's what they need to do just to get the farm going. Right. That farm, once it's up and running for a number of years, if they can meet their metrics and they can, you know, fill the farm with fish, those prices can, those prices become more flexible. And if they expand, right, they can be more flexible, but it's kind of begging the question to say that the price of the seafood has to be high. You know, I think, I think that's one of the things that we're here to talk about is that, is that there's a lot of complexity that goes into that pricing. And if we don't understand it, like the, the spider web I was showing in my presentation, if we don't understand all that complexity, then we are kind of doomed to the sense that it has to be for people of means or only for celebrations and things like that. So, I was doing the farmer's markets and How about that? Okay, so when I was doing the farmer markets, um, as far as sustainability, it was disheartening to sell tuna and swordfish all day. And that's what everyone wanted. It was super expensive. And I didn't want to sell that, but that's what everyone wanted. I couldn't go and sell 200 oysters and make $200 for my day. Um, so I was so happy when we got to work together because it's education. And you sat right next to my farmer's market and said, here is a recipe, here is um, another available local fish that is so great for the environment. And by the way, it's not $25 a pound, this is $4, $5 a pound. And the creativity, the education that the chefs can bring to this, I mean, if you wanna um, you know, fight climate change, if you wanna do sustainability, sell these other fish, sell these local fish that people don't know about education, um, is the best way to save our water and um, to feed people because those fish are so plentiful and keep coming and the fishermen just throw them back. So education and using those other fish. Great. Well, I wanna thank our panel. It was a uh, excellent discussion. Thank you for thinking about the topics. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Mike for his concluding remarks and then we can go eat some fish. tables, there's an evaluation, right? There is a QR code on there. If you just want to scan it and complete it on your phone, you can do that. I will also follow up with an email, but if you could do that before you leave today, that would be fantastic. Thank you again to our panelists, our speakers, for all of you for participating, our virtual participants, and our sponsors, Atkinson Center for Sustainability. Um, if you have questions, feel free to, to mix, mingle, and speak, and go enjoy the food in the foyer. All right, thank you all for coming today. Mike's the glue that holds it together. He's going to make sure it all gets hot. Set over the kitchen and bread. Making the URL. I guess that fan is not the bottom there.
Gracias. 